do you think? Inside the Oscars. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Disturbing night vision images of very young children dropped from a 14-foot wall like sacks of potatoes. A five-year-old and three-year-old pair of girls abandoned at the border by human smugglers. The children left to fend for themselves in the harsh desert elements. Thankfully, they are okay. Border Patrol agents were able to spot the tender-aged children and have them checked out at a hospital. And those agents are now working with Mexican authorities to identify the two smugglers who ran off. Step all the face away. Okay, so please don't shoot me. Please, man. I'm not going to shoot you. Step on the face away. A gut-wrenching day in court. New video played today. George Floyd's final moments. The first police officer to take the stand on day three of the trial of Derek Chauvin. The prosecution making their case with the new evidence revealed today. Major news tonight about the Pfizer vaccine and children. With the first data from trials of those as young as 12 years old. The company saying the vaccine tested with 100% effectiveness in preventing COVID in children. President Biden Biden's new massive infrastructure spending proposal focused on rebuilding roads and bridges across the country, stronger internet service for rural America, creating potentially millions of jobs. They're among the highest value investments we can make in the nation. Our infrastructure is crumbling. We rank 13th in the world. Tonight, how the president plans to pay for it. The stunning new report about an investigation involving Florida Congressman Matt Gates, the outspoken conservative now being looked at by the Justice Department over his alleged relationship with a 17-year-old girl. The congressman claims he's being extorted. And the dramatic fall from grace for a popular pizza tycoon, Papa John's founder John Schnatter forced out of his namesake company in 2018 after reports he used a racial slur on a conference call, why he's now releasing the full audio from that call. Call. Do you think that it's possible to not have racist intent but still have racist impact? Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. An attorney for George Floyd's family described the heaviness of the accounts and videos that played out in court today as a real-life version of how to get away with murder, along with tearful testimony. We also saw the body camera footage from two of the officers that had not been seen publicly until today, some calling that video traumatic. One man who witnessed officers detain George Floyd told jurors that he felt helpless and tried to personally convince Floyd not to struggle, telling him, you can't win. That man, a self-described nosy elder of the neighborhood, said he had talked to Derek Chauvin just days before the May incident. And then there was this video, also released for the first time today, that shows Floyd inside Cup Foods moments before officers arrested him then outside. Prosecutors questioning the man who had suspected Floyd had used a counterfeit $20 bill. The judge then taking several surprise breaks today as three days into the trial, emotions run high among witnesses and jurors. Alex Perez leads us off tonight and a warning. Some may find the video we're about to show disturbing. The jury today hearing from 61-year-old Charles McMillan, who lives right there in that South Minneapolis neighborhood. Composed on the stand, he spoke of what he witnessed, the officers struggling with George Floyd in their squad car, and what he remembers telling Floyd. I was telling Mr. Floyd, Mr. Floyd, just ply with him, get on in the car because you can't win. You could hear his words through the police body cam played in court. I'm not trying to win. I'm not trying to win. Floyd pleading with the officers. Don't do me like that, man. Get in the car. Okay, can I talk to you, please? It's you get in this car. We can talk. I am a dog. I'm claustrophobic. I'm claustrophobic, man. working with me. God, I'm claustrophobic, man. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the front. Please. No, you're not getting in the car. I've got the so I was in, in the car. The officers then pull him from the squad car. Man, in the car. I'm not a bad guy. Ah, 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 oh, God. Ah, oh, man. Ah, I'm in trouble. Please, officer. Please. They pull Floyd to the ground, Chauvin with his knee on Floyd's neck, and you hear him repeatedly say, I can't breathe. But that witness today, Charles McMillan, breaking down as he hears George Floyd call for his mother all over again. Mr. McMillan, wait a minute. <laughs> Thank you. 
って。<笑>ウィフロイドは、フロイドは、The store worker, with his hand on his head, then watched the tragedy unfold, saying he felt guilty. All of this over a $20 bill. What was going through your mind during that time period?、Uh, disbelief and guilt.、Okay. Why guilt?、Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. Still carrying some remorse from the ultimate outcome of that day. And Alex Perez joins us now from Minneapolis. Alex, there are, of course, all the witnesses who are reliving what they saw that day. But looming large over all of this, the jury. One juror calling for a break today. What can you tell us about how they're reacting to the video and also the testimony? Yeah, Lindsay, you know, on television, we can see most of the witnesses, but the jurors, you can't. And they've had to several times watch these painful videos. One juror today telling the judge she wasn't feeling well, that she had a lot of tension. She says she hasn't been sleeping well, that she has been awake since 2 a.m. because of the stress associated with this trial. The judge then called for a break. And when they returned, she was able to continue. But it was very clear that this is a difficult process for the jury, Lindsay. Yeah, emotionally taxing for so many. And also, Alex, that New body camera video, while hard to watch, painting a more complete picture really about what happened that day than we've had at this point in the past 10 months. Yeah, definitely, Lindsay. This is clearly the prosecutor's、uh, strategy, right? They're playing all the different angles of this video. They first introduced the jury to all of these witnesses. So, those voices that they're hearing in these different videos, they now know who those people are. And now they're showing them the videos piece by piece, frame by frame, from every different angle. And it's difficult to counter some of these、uh, images that the jury is seeing. You, in court today, the defense attorney did not cross examine several of the witnesses because it seemed he just wanted to move on. So, That is the strategy, strategy right now, it appears, from the prosecution. Just show these videos and explain to the jury what exactly was happening in those moments so they can see it for themselves and have all of this video to review when they go back to deliberate eventually, Lindsay. 
Alex Perez reporting in for us from Minneapolis. Thanks, Alex. And for more analysis of today's testimony, we bring in ABC News contributor and host of the Law and Crime Network, Brian Buckmeyer. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. You were actually inside the courtroom today. Describe for us what you saw and heard and felt that may not have been captured on that video feed that many of us watched all day. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. Um, well, let me preface it this way. I'm a public defender. I have homicide cases that I carry. I have serious felonies. But even in that room, from a feeling standpoint, I sat feet away from Rodney Floyd, the youngest brother of George Floyd, a feet in, away in another direction of uh, AG Keith Ellison. And I saw that witness talk and break down as he spoke about the case and his mother dying um, recently. The room is thick with emotion. You can feel it. When they testify, when you watch the video, you, you can't help but feel the emotion from the person who's testifying and their regret, their anger, their fear. You can feel everything. From what you're seeing, jurors are attentive. They are focused on everything. They're taking notes. They are Their ears are peaking up at the right time. They are definitely doing their job uh, that they've been asked and tasked to do. And we're not able to see the jury. You were. Any emotion from them? So it's hard to tell with emotion. I think for, for all of us right now in the pandemic, because you have a mask on for the whole thing. So I'm trying to pick up on crossed arms, um, hands being folded, leaning or body language, or when they move to the edge of their seat to, 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 to hear more, they move back and slouch back. That's the best I can do because of the masks uh, going on right now and the COVID restrictions. But from what I'm seeing, it looks like they're listening. It looks like they're paying attention. There's about two or three jurors actually that the, interesting enough that aren't watching the video when it gets very intense you can see they kind of turn away and look directly ahead i think they're going to probably rely on the other jurors who are watching and some people I, i've been calling some of them star pupils it's look like, looks like they're studying for the lsat and, and in some cases some just that video just too hard for them to watch we also heard of course more emotional testimony from bystanders today they're clearly still haunted from what they saw some even crying on the witness stand does it seem like the prosecution is trying to highlight how george floyd's death impacted the the community at large and how do you think that that plays with the jury i think that the prosecution is being smart because what i'm looking at is not only the emotional aspect, but also the logical aspect of it. I know yesterday we had uh, four teenagers testify, and a lot of people were saying, why why, why would you put these, these children, because that's what they are, children to testify about something that adults are going to be able to testify to? Well, in terms of an, in the statute for aggravated departure, that means the ability to sentence someone to higher than the maximum of a charge, because we're all talking about 40 years for murder in the second degree, one of the four aggravating circumstances that the prosecution can use if Derek Chauvin is found guilty is committing the crime in front of the children. And if you do that, you can actually ask a judge to give a person more than 40 years. The other thing that you can ask for more years is if you commit the crime with a group of three or more who are actively participating in that crime, three officers on George Floyd's back kind of does that. If the act is particularly cruel, leaving a knee on someone's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds sounds pretty cruel. And if the victim is particularly vulnerable because of some sort of physical uh, impairment, being handcuffed while this all is happening, I think matches that description. So it's emotional, yes, but I think they're also attacking the statute to try to see if they can tack on more years if he's convicted. And we're almost out of time, but do want to ask you, the prosecution chose to play that video of George Floyd and Cup Foods before his arrest. He seems to be under the influence, and even the prosecution's own witness, Chris Martin, said as much today that he seemed to be high. If you're the prosecution, why would you include that? Two reasons. I'm trying to take the sting away from the defense attorney who's going to bring that up, and that's going to be the bread and butter of their argument. But also, I think we're going to see officers testify later on in this in this trial and say, I handle sober uh, suspects one way, but when I think that someone has a mental health issue, they're intoxicated on alcohol or drugs or other substances, or they just can't perceive reality in the same way that we all do, I need to handle them with extra care. And it's that extra care that Derek Chauvin didn't provide George Floyd that I think they're really going to try to nail him to come summation. Brian Buckmeyer, appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for your time tonight. My pleasure. Thank you.
President Biden was in Pittsburgh today to unveil his sweeping $2 trillion infrastructure plan aimed at fixing roads and bridges, expanding internet access, and making a new push for clean energy. The president says it'll be paid for with tax increases on the wealthy and corporations. ABC News senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce has those details. Calling it a once-in-a-generation opportunity, President Biden today kicking off his next big push, outlining a massive jobs and infrastructure plan. It's big, yes. It's bold, yes. And we can get it done. The roughly $2 trillion plan includes $115 billion for roads and bridges, $100 billion to extend broadband access to 100% of the country, $180 billion for research and development, including a major clean energy push, and $45 billion to replace every lead pipe in the U.S. By one estimate, it could create 2.3 million jobs by 2024. It will create millions of jobs, good paying jobs. The president touting that his plan would fix 20,000 miles of roads and over 10,000 bridges badly in need of repair. Bridges like the Brent Spence Bridge over the Ohio River, one of the busiest trucking routes in the U.S., carrying more than $1 billion worth of freight every day. It now transports about twice as many vehicles a day as it was designed to handle. Our infrastructure is crumbling. We rank 13th in the world. To pay for it all, a tax hike, raising the corporate rate from 21 to 28 percent, new penalties for companies that ship jobs overseas. And Biden has made clear he wants to raise taxes on the most wealthy, but promising those making less than $400,000 a year won't see their taxes go up. Now, this is going to be a tough sell over on Capitol Hill. Republicans are not on board. Leader Mitch McConnell today calling this a Trojan horse for a massive tax increase. And there are already cracks among Democrats. Tonight, some progressive members say this plan simply isn't big enough. With that 50-50 split in the Senate, this is facing a really long road ahead. And, of course, this is just the first in a two-part plan to jumpstart the economy. Up next, Biden is expected to outline investments in child care, education, and health care. Overall, the total cost of all of this expected to be in the range of $4 trillion. Lindsay. Mary Bruce reporting in from the White House. Thanks, Mary. And we are joined now by U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. Thank you so much for your time. You heard Mary there reporting that some progressive Democrats are saying this plan isn't enough. A statement from uh, House Progressive says that the plan, quote, can and should be substantially larger in size and scope. But some moderate Democrats are concerned about the $2 trillion price. Tag. How does President Biden plan to thread that needle to get all Democrats on the same page? And, and what's the timeline for getting it done? Yeah. So good evening and thank you for having me. The president has been very clear. He wants to work across the aisle with members of Congress in order to get this done. He has done what a leader does. He puts forth his vision, and it is a bold vision. It's a $2 trillion historic size investment broadly in infrastructure. We'll put millions of Americans to work. And now the discussions begin. And he's been very clear with us on his team that we are to work collaboratively with members of Congress to hear their ideas. But what will not be acceptable is doing nothing, because we can't wait. So the answer to your question of how quickly we want to get going, we're going to, we're working immediately to go ahead and produce results for the American people, get people back to work, rebuild roads and bridges and housing and broadband and waterways. It's America deserves it and it's time to get it done. And you say doing nothing is not an option. Is President Biden prepared to go forward without any Republicans on this vote, as he did for the COVID relief bill? Is that an acceptable route on the issue of infrastructure for areas like repairing roads and bridges, which is usually a rare bipartisan agreement? Yeah, so it is much too early to start talking about that. The president outlined his vision a, a, a couple of hours ago. So today is the beginning. Today, we have, the president has outlined an extraordinary, broad, bold vision to invest in America, and we begin the discussion on Capitol Hill. We believe there is room for compromise, but, but room for bipartisan support. This is this is, this is an American proposal. This is allowing American businesses and workers to compete, to compete with China, to compete in the world today, to stand back up after the devastation of COVID and to, as the president would say, build back better and build back more equally. 
And lastly, Republicans in Congress have already expressed opposition to the call for increasing the corporate tax rate. How do you respond to concerns that raising taxes on American corporations, many that were hit hard during the pandemic, could hurt the recovery? And any concern that trillions more in spending could lead to inflation, which hurts the economy? So again, I just keep going back to look at the alternative. The option of not making these investments would be devastating for America and devastating for American businesses. This is about enhancing American competitiveness so businesses can grow faster and better. Work, they need a, a workforce that has the skills required. They, it's in their interest for every American to have broadband. There are historic investments here in research and development, in manufacturing. Let's get back into the business of making things in America and advanced manufacturing. So fundamentally, at its core, it's a bill about uh, a package about enhancing American competitiveness. And as it relates to the tax increases, they are reasonable. Uh, they are also competitive. And again, let's begin the discussion. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Next to the encouraging vaccine news, Pfizer announced today their vaccine was 100% effective at preventing illness in children 12 to 16 years old. Stephanie Ramos has more on that. Tonight, a major step toward getting millions of children vaccinated by the fall. Pfizer reporting its vaccine was 100% effective in children ages 12 to 15. None of the children who got the real vaccine developed COVID-19. This is like really a high level of efficacy. No side effects that we're seeing so far. So we've got to have the FDA do the full evaluation, but I think this is terrific. 12-year-old Caleb Chung doesn't know if he got the vaccine or a placebo, but he wanted to be a part of the trial. Potentially helping other kids to feel safe and want to get the vaccine in the future when it becomes publicly available um, was really some way that I could actually help out. Last week, Pfizer started testing vaccine doses on children ages 5 to 11. For me, okay. Two. Three. Nine-year-old twins Marisol and Alejandra Gerardo got the vaccine last week. Both parents, who are doctors, say the girls handled it well. Five, six, good. seven. They're doing great right now. The first day after, they both had sore arms, and then one of my daughters had a little bit of a fever as well as some swollen um, lymph nodes in her armpit, but other than that, that quickly result. Tonight, an all-out sprint to vaccinate. The country hitting a new milestone, 150 million shots in arms. But rising coronavirus cases and hospitalizations are looming. This is a critical moment in our fight against the pandemic. As we see increases in cases, we can't afford to let our guard down. The CDC director urging Americans to keep wearing masks and social distance because there are still new challenges ahead. The Wisconsin Supreme Court today striking down that state's mask mandate and Delta Airlines announcing its flights will soon have less room. The company will start selling those middle seats after a year long ban. People still longing to get back to normal. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. And, and Stephanie, we're learning of quality control issues found in a Baltimore plant run by Emergent Biosolutions that helps make the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The human error was discovered during the validation process. What's the company's response tonight? So we're just getting that response, Lindsay, uh, just a few moments ago. Johnson & Johnson, they're saying that vaccines that were finished and distributed were never in jeopardy. Here's exactly what they're saying, that they've met their delivery targets and are still confident they will deliver 100 million doses in the first half of the year as expected. Now, this plant was not yet authorized by the FDA, and this quality control issue, Johnson & Johnson says, is part of the checks and balances that keep the manufacturing safe once it starts. Lindsay. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. And when we come back, a suspect has been arrested and charged with a hate crime for that horrific attack on an Asian American woman on her way to church. Our conversation with the founder and former face of Papa John's Pizza speaking out about the racial slur that cost him so much. He claims there is much more to the story. You'll get to hear it for yourself. And the Florida congressman and rising conservative star reportedly under investigation for an alleged relationship with an underage girl. His defense up next.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched news. Newscast, number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back. Florida Congressman Matt Gates is reportedly under federal investigation for an alleged relationship with an underage girl. The conservative star is denying any wrongdoing and says that he's actually the target of an extortion attempt. ABC's Rachel Scott has the very latest. I have not had a relationship with a 17-year-old. That is totally false. Tonight, Florida Republican Congressman Matt Gates firing back at allegations he had a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old. It is a horrible allegation, and it is a lie. The denial following a New York Times report that Gates is currently under investigation by the Justice Department and that the probe started months ago during the Trump administration when Bill Barr was attorney general. Investigators looking into the alleged relationship from two years ago and whether Gates possibly violated sex trafficking laws when he allegedly paid for travel and other expenses for the teen. Late today, sources telling ABC News that federal authorities have already interviewed multiple witnesses and that the probe into his conduct has expanded beyond Florida. The conservative firebrand and Trump ally insisting he is the victim, alleging extortion, claiming a former DOJ official reached out to his family just weeks ago. A person demanded $25 million in exchange for making horrible sex trafficking allegations against me go away. Gates telling Axios he's, quote, a generous partner in his adult relationships who has paid for flights for hotel rooms and that now someone is trying to make that look criminal when it's not. The congressman also went on Fox News just hours after the story broke, trying to defend himself. You and I went to dinner uh, about two years ago. Your wife was there, and I brought a friend of mine. You'll remember her. And she was actually threatened by the FBI, told that if she wouldn't cop to the fact that somehow I was involved in some pay-for-play scheme, uh, that she could face trouble. I don't remember the, the woman you're speaking of or the context at all, honestly. Matt Gates really hung out to dry there. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, how are Republicans on Capitol Hill reacting to this investigation and any word from the Justice Department on where things all stand? 
Well, the Justice Department still declining to comment tonight, but House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy calling those allegations against Gates serious. He says if they are true, that he will be stripped from his committee assignments, but that for now he is waiting for more information. He's also looking to talk to Gates as well. And sources tell us that Gates has been reaching out to prominent D.C. attorneys, including one that represented Steve Bannon, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Still ahead here on Prime, you saw that disturbing video at the top of the show. Two young children dropped over a border wall. What we know about this incident coming up. The Real Housewives star charged with fraud. And it's cherry blossom season, but early. We take a look at why by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the Secretary of Defense confirming the Biden administration policy that transgender people can serve openly as who they are. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News. Honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News. America's number one news source. Welcome back, everyone. And now to yet another possible sign of man-made climate change, the early bloom of Japan's famed and beloved cherry blossom trees, a symbol of spring and rebirth in that culture. We take a look by the numbers. March 26th, that's when the cherry blossoms hit their flowery peak in Kyoto, Japan this year, the earliest peak in 1,200 years. That's right, more than 1,000 years because that's how long historic documents, diaries, and poetry books have recorded this culturally significant event, according to Osaka University researchers. The previous record was set in 1409. These trees are highly sensitive to temperature, and scientists have linked this early bloom to global warming. 51.1 degrees Fahrenheit, that was the average temperature this March in Kyoto, climbing from an average of 47.5 degrees Fahrenheit in the early 1950s. March 20th, that was the peak bloom of those iconic cherry blossoms in our nation's capital this year, also coming a bit earlier than usual. More than 3,000 of those glorious trees were gifted by the mayor of Tokyo in 1912 to symbolize the friendship between the U.S. and Japan. Now those delicate blooms could be an ominous sign of our shared fight for our climate. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. His dramatic fall from grace from the company he founded after saying the N-word made national headlines. And tonight he's claiming it was a setup. 
winter's last gasp. Our weather train is tracking snow and severe storms. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Rich. We taught all our patients how much they are loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. Jurors in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin hearing today from Christopher Martin, the clerk at Cub Foods who received the counterfeit $20 bill from George Floyd on the day he died. When I um, saw the bill, I noticed that it had a blue pigment to it. The prosecution playing surveillance video from both inside and outside the store as Martin described how he felt that day. Uh, disbelief. Thank you. My guilt. Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. The jury today hearing from 61-year-old Charles McMillan, who lives right there in that South Minneapolis neighborhood. McMillan breaking down as he hears George Floyd call for his mother all over again. Mr. McMillan, can you a minute? <laughs> Chauvin is facing manslaughter and second and third degree murder charges to which he has pleaded not guilty. The three other officers involved in Floyd's death go on trial later this year. President Biden in Pittsburgh unveiling the details of his massive $2 trillion infrastructure proposal that he says will help boost the American economy. It's not a plan that tinkers around the edges. It's a once in a generation investment. In America. The president outlining his new plan, which calls for billions of dollars for new roads and bridges, new investments in public transportation and broadband internet, especially in rural parts of the country, and replacing 100% of lead pipes. The Biden administration proposing an increase to the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%, as well as adding new penalties for corporations that move jobs overseas. But the pay for will be undoing some of the Trump tax cuts. Let's see what this infrastructure package looks like. If it's a Trojan horse for a massive tax increase, put me down as highly skeptical. 
just released by U.S. Customs and Border Protection shows two young children being dropped over a border fence in New Mexico. We're told those children were three and five years old and from Ecuador. You can see the smugglers dropping them over that 14-foot fence and then abandoning them. Border Patrol agents found the children and took them to a local hospital. Police say this man, 38-year-old Brandon Elliott, is behind bars, arrested on charges of felony assault as a hate crime after this brutal beating of a 65-year-old Asian woman. Authorities say surveillance video shows Elliott violently kicking the woman to the ground and then repeatedly on the head. They say he also made anti-Asian statements telling the woman she didn't belong here. Tonight we're learning that 38-year-old Elliott served 17 years in prison for killing his own mother. He was released on a a lifetime parole in November 2019. Real Housewives of Salt Lake City star Jennifer Shaw under arrest. She's facing up to 50 years in jail after being accused of defrauding hundreds of victims in an alleged massive telemarketing scam. In this town, I'm Queen B and MVP. She's now being federally charged with conspiracy to commit wire fraud and money laundering. Authorities alleging that for nearly 10 years, she pushed so-called business opportunities on vulnerable, often elderly working class people only to steal their money. Authorities also alleging she sold lists of potential victims' personal information for them to be repeatedly scammed. Stuart Smith, one of Shaw's assistants, was also arrested. He is facing the same charges as an alleged co-conspirator. Delta Airlines lifting one of its COVID restrictions. The air carrier says it is now making middle seats available again. Delta was the last airline to still block the seats to help with social distancing. The airline says the policy will end May 1st as vaccinations become more widespread and confidence in travel increases. Snacks service will return in mid-April and tickets that were going to expire this year will be extended through next year. Masks will still be required on flights. Welcome back. Our weather team is tracking a new system that is bringing severe storms and along with it, snow. And this is no April Fool's joke. We have snow maps up in April. Rob, tell us the latest. Hey, Lindsay, the same system that's bringing rain and then snow here in the northeast is bringing severe weather to the south. Already one tornado reported on the ground in southeast Alabama, right where they don't need it. And several tornado warnings have been uh, issued for parts of South Carolina. But the watch, the severe weather watch is up for Pensacola, Mobile, Dothan, Alabama for the next hour or two. If not tornadoes, 70 plus mile per hour winds with some of these storms and they're driving across southeast Georgia as well. The low that's going to ride the Appalachians and kind of slow down this front will bring storms and showers across the Carolinas tonight and through the mid-Atlantic, the Delmarva, and through the I-95 corridor, heavy rain and a cold rain at that through tomorrow morning. And look, it, this thing doesn't clear out until well into the afternoon, if not tomorrow night, and cold air coming in behind it. Not just to make it a cold rain, but snows five to ten inches of snow in parts of upstate New York and, and northern New England. And then the cold air coming behind this tomorrow night. Look at the wind chills Friday morning, 32 in Little Rock, 29 in Nashville. They've got flood advisories out still with the river so high there and uh, feeling like the teens in Columbus, Ohio and, and Pittsburgh. Uh, this is <laughs> this is no April Fool's joke. I know tomorrow is the first, uh, but keep your parka handy. Looks like into the first few days of the month of April. Lindsay up to 10 inches. All right, Rob, thanks so much. His face was once a regular presence on the airwaves, but the former CEO of Papa John's Pizza, John Schnatter, experienced a dramatic fall from grace as he was forced out of the company he founded after reports that he used a racial slur on a training conference call in 2018. But now Schnatter has tapes that he says tell his side of the story as he tries to repair his reputation. In an interview in 2019, you said, stay tuned, the day of reckoning will come, the record will be straight. Is that why you're here today? I think that's one of the reasons I'm here, but uh, for sure the truth's gonna come out, nothing sells like the truth, and uh, the tape is the truth. What John Schnatter calls the truth has never been heard until now. It's the tape of an incident that led to the erasure of the man who for decades made his name and face synonymous with his multi-billion dollar company. John Schnatter was not only the founder of Papa John's, but also its front man. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. In 2010, Papa John's became the official pizza sponsor of the NFL. Better ingredients, better pizza, better football, Papa John's. 
But in 2017, sales were sliding, and Schnatter appeared to place the blame on the NFL's handling of player protests during the national anthem, which had become a political football. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners, when somebody disrespects our flag, to say, get that son of a off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! In a conference call to discuss quarterly earnings, Schnatter said the NFL is hurting, and more importantly, by not resolving the current debacle to the player and owner's satisfaction, NFL leadership has hurt Papa John's shareholders. This should have been nipped in the bud a year and a half ago. Papa John's immediately faced backlash from those who said the company was opposing the player protests against police brutality, a claim Schnatter says was inaccurate. Papa John's is a family of small businesses. And the NFL is our biggest spend. And so every year when the fall came around, our sales would go up. When the controversy started, uh, sales did the other. They went down. So you would say that you were never anti the protests? Oh, absolutely not. Um, in fact, I think uh, criminal justice reform uh, has to happen. But immediately after his 2017 comments on the NFL, Schnatter's words were latched onto by hate groups online. The neo-Nazi site, the Daily Stormer, dubbing Papa John's the official pizza of the alt-right, a claim Papa John's immediately disavowed. Not again! A few months later, Papa John's and the NFL had ended their partnership, and Schnatter had stepped down from his role as CEO in what he says was a planned transition. Schnatter remained the board chairman, but the damage to his reputation remained, prompting the company to hire a marketing agency called Laundry Service to work to rebuild Schnatter's image. In May of 2018, Schnatter joined a call for what he says was planned as a discussion about how to get him back into Papa John's commercials. The purpose of the call was very clear. We had a marketing meeting the week before, and the call was about the creative, strategic uh, creative, and what do we do as far as putting me back in the ads. Once I got on the call, they switched it from this is a brand marketing strategic initiative to this is going to be a diversity call with regards to race. It was on that call that Schnatter uttered the words that would lead to his undoing, when two months later, allegations appeared publicly in a July 2018 Forbes report that he used a racial slur during that call. The face of Papa John's pizza is changing. Now to that breaking news overnight, Papa John's founder resigning as chairman of the board for the pizza chain. Papa John's shares fell nearly 5%. Fallout was swift. He was wiped from all marketing and says he had to step down from the board of the company he launched in 1984 out of a broom closet of his father's bar in Indiana. When you build something with your bare hands from nothing and then you um, get thrown out of the, really thrown, kicked to the street. I mean, the board of directors on a Wednesday were my biggest fans and then all of a sudden Sunday they kicked me to the curb. Uh, I, I would have liked a decent burial. But now he feels a resurrection is in order as a result of these newly released recordings. I hope he gets sent out to the pastor on this. Really, really. According to Schnatter, the training call had been recorded without his knowledge by Laundry Service, the company Papa John's had hired to help his image. And now he says for the first time, people can hear for themselves what was said on that call. On the call, Schnatter disavows racist groups, and he again downplays his comments from the prior year on the NFL protests. It wasn't intentional to be insensitive to police brutality. I mean, that wouldn't even be in my mind. Or, you know, be you know, anti-supportive. But at the end of the call, he expresses frustration over his being tied to racists over his comments on the NFL, and instead points to another famous fast food founder. What about the Colonel Sanders called black I'm like, I've never used that word. And they get away with it. Yeah, we use the word debacle, we get framed in the same, uh, same genre. It's crazy. It's the whole thing's crazy. The family of Colonel Sanders has denied he ever used racist language and in 2018 called Schnatter's claim a, quote, absolute lie. In retrospect, what do you think about your use of the actual word? Well, I said the word, I didn't use the word. I cited the word, I mentioned the word, I paraphrased what another founder uh, used to say or did that I would never say. Um, have I over again what I wish I'd have said the N word? Of course, <laughs> of course. So why didn't you? The context was used as a contrast. I never used the word. This guy uses the word. I never used that word. It was to make a point. Do you think that it's possible to not have 
racist intent but still have racist impact? I think if you use a racial slur, you have ill intent. You know, I think if you cite the word as an example, not don't use that word, I don't think that's ill intent. I think that is anti-racist, absolutely. Would you agree that the N-word, the real word, is arguably the weightiest word in the English language? And I'm wondering if you felt that only in the aftermath or if at the time when you said it, you knew the power of actually stating the N-word. Because if you had just said the N-word, we probably wouldn't even be talking about this right now. Right. Um, I think the word, the reason I was using it in the context and the reference I was is because I despised the word. Don't use that word. I never use the word. If I had over it again, would I not use the word? Absolutely. Do you think that you exercised good leadership by using the actual word? If I had it over again, I would use the N word instead of saying Colonel Sanders actually calls black people the word. I definitely would use the N word. Um, not the word. His focus has now shifted to another word, set up. When you look on the surface, it looks like I caused the problem. When you really dig into it, you can see that laundry servers authored the problem and they set me up. Many people are going to have a hard time understanding. Laundry service was hired by Papa John's to help you, right? So why <laughs> would they, as you call, set you up? Laundry service was hired to protect me. Uh, it actually came to be that they persecuted me. They were persecutors. They did evil deeds and they tried to hide them. Schnatter is suing Laundry Service and its parent company, Wasserman Media, alleging in a recently unsealed amended complaint that Laundry Service acted with ill intent and to use Mr. Schnatter's comments against him by leaking the comments to Forbes, stating in the complaint that defendant's conduct was malicious, intentional, unfair, and unreasonable under the circumstances. Laundry Service has responded, seeking to dismiss the suit, denying that they leaked his remarks on the call to Forbes. And they argue that Schnatter, who voluntarily resigned from the board following the Forbes article, scored an own goal by using vile racist language and is the architect of his own demise. But through the legal discovery process, it was revealed that someone within Laundry Service continued recording their conversation after Schnatter left the May 2018 call after his use of the racial slur. That's when former Laundry Service CEO Jason Stein made these comments. I hope he gets set up the pastor on this. Really, really. Super. And Stein then added that he wanted Schnatter to make similar remarks in a public interview. I just wanted to go and speak the truth. And I wanted to write down the bullet points and then let him go. He just has to make sure it's an hour long conversation yep. so that he says like he said here. When you first heard that tape, the one that was taped internally by laundry service, what was your reaction? Well, I used to tell my friends, I said, you know, I, you're not gonna believe this, I think I was set up. And now with the tape, it's like they understand because it's, it's so far-fetched that an agency that's supposed to be your protector is actually gonna set you up to be the worst thing you can be uh, in this day and age, in, in this situation uh, at this time is to be painted as a racist. As Schnatter tries to clear his name, he's pointing to a report commissioned by his attorneys by former director of the FBI, Louis Free, from this past December, saying Schnatter's comments were neither intended nor can reasonably be interpreted to reflect any racial bias, and that his comments were wildly taken out of context by some media and others. I think it's a series of vindication. I think the Louis Free report uh, vindicated. I think the uh, initial tape exonerated rates me because um, it was uh, anti-racist um, at, uh, at the best. And then, of course, uh, the latest tape from Laundry Service indicts them. So I think it's vindication all the way around. I think it's, it's a total 360. I just want to get an understanding from you, because when you say the, the tape exonerates me, I think people are going to think that he didn't learn the lesson. He didn't learn the power of when he uttered a word, even when he's using it to say, I don't use this word. Right. Well, for, for sure, you, you learn your lesson for, in going through this uh, by like a thousand fold, maybe more. 
Um, that's why I don't like cancel culture. Um, you know, if I can uh, make sure my grandkids and kids don't have to live with this, my friends don't have to live with this, I clear my name, and then we point out the fact is don't rush to judgment. With That's the problem with cancel culture. Whether either side of the aisle is there's a rush to judgment. Um, it can be taken out of context. It can be built on a false narrative, and it can destroy people's lives. And so you feel that you were an unfair victim of cancel culture? I totally feel like I was a victim of cancel culture. I mean, it was a false narrative. But Schnatter himself has had some difficulty selling his story. Earlier this month, Schnatter appeared on OAN, a far-right cable channel, when word of the laundry service tapes was first reported. And we've had three goals for the last 20 months, to get rid of this uh, N-word uh, in my uh, vocabulary. What did you mean to say when you said, I'm trying oh. to get the N-word out of my vocabulary? I transposed my vocabulary to the media vocabulary. The media needs to get rid of this vocabulary with regards to me. It's not the in my association. Yeah, the association. It was the media's vocabulary, the association with me, not my vocabulary. Again, I never use the word. I'm offended by the word. And in that May 2018 training call with laundry service, he did make disparaging remarks about NFL players and Commissioner Roger Goodell. But Schnatter stands by the majority of his comments on that fateful 2018 call, which his team has now posted in full online. Well, the entire 55 minutes was basically anti-racist because the way I was raised and the way I treat people and uh, the way we, we ran Papa John's was all about people. Um, you know, now we have a tape, we have the truth. It remains to be seen whether the tale of that tape provides the vindication he's seeking. And finally tonight, our image of the day. Pro-democracy protesters running to avoid military forces during a demonstration in the capital of Myanmar. Violence has turned even deadlier in recent days, certainly a reminder of the lengths people are willing to go to for democracy. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Good night. And coming up in the next hour, we're staying on top of several things. Matthew Russian, the former college student with autism, sentenced to 10 years behind bars after a car crash. His story went viral. The Virginia governor pardoned him. And tonight, he's telling us his story. And the Free Britney movement has gotten a jolt from the pop icon herself. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. 
It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Is social media's cancel culture? My 14-year-old son said, Dad, TikTok is full of Menendez Brothers videos. Trying to cancel. There's over 130 million views. The Menendez Brothers prison sentences. I don't believe they got a fair trial. I do not believe that this was premeditated murder. I don't believe that someone could fake that kind of emotion. Now, new interviews and the new prison interview. The charge never could so easily not have happened. The 2020 event special, Friday night on ABC. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Some welcome news in the fight against COVID. Pfizer claims human trials on children between 12 and 15 years old was 100% effective. You heard that right, 100% effective at preventing COVID with no serious side effects. The company is expected to ask the FDA to authorize vaccine use for children as young as 12. This is, we're learning, potentially millions of Johnson & Johnson vaccines can no longer be used after a quality control issue at a plant that makes the one shot dose. President Biden unveiled his massive two trillion dollar infrastructure plan to rebuild roads and bridges and bring stronger internet to rural America. He says it's a once in a generation opportunity. The White House claims it will create millions of jobs and be paid for by raising corporate taxes. But if Democrats don't come to unified terms on a plan, it is dead on arrival, most likely because Republicans are already blasting its high costs. And Republican Congressman and rising GOP star Matt Gates of Florida, close Trump ally, is facing allegations that he had an alleged relationship with a 17-year-old girl. He claims this is all a big extortion plot. The sources tell ABC News that federal authorities Authorities have already interviewed multiple witnesses and that the probe into his conduct has expanded beyond Florida. Now to day three of the Derek Chauvin trial, the public getting its first look at body camera video from that day. Emotions running high as witnesses and jurors react to just what they saw. Our Alex Perez reports in a warning that some viewers may find the video you're about to see disturbing. The jury today hearing from 61-year-old Charles McMillan, who lives right there in that South Minneapolis neighborhood. Composed on the stand, he spoke of what he witnessed, the officers struggling with George Floyd in their squad car, and what he remembers telling Floyd. I was telling Mr. Floyd, Ms. Blood, just ply with them, get on in the car because you can't win. You could hear his words through the police body cam played in court. I'm not trying to win. I'm not trying to win. Floyd pleading with the officers. Don't do me like that, man. Get in the car. Okay, can I talk to you, please? Yes, you get in was, this car. We can talk. I am a dog. I'm claustrophobic. I'm not the you're not working with me. The officers then pull him from the squad car. Man, in the car. I'm not a bad guy. Ah, ah, oh, ah, oh, man. Ah, I'm with my Please, officer. Please. Please, take a seat. Ah, please, man, please. No, no, I can't joke. I can't breathe. They pull Floyd to the ground, Chauvin with his knee on Floyd's neck, and you hear him repeatedly say, I can't breathe. But that witness today, Charles McMillan, breaking down as he hears George Floyd call for his mother all over again. Mr. McMillan, can you a minute? <laughs> Prosecutor asking McMillan to respond to the images from that police body cam. 
Can you just explain sort of what you're feeling in this moment? I can I feel helpless. I don't have a mama either. I understand him. My mom died June 25th. Hang on just one second, Mr. Let's, uh, let's take a quick time out. We'll take a little break. After the break, the questioning resumed. What stood out to you about what Mr. Floyd was saying when you saw him on the ground? When he kept saying, I can't breathe, and when he said, Mama, you're killing me. Hey, you're killing me. That's what I kept hearing. When Floyd was taken away in an ambulance, McMillan approached Officer Derek Chauvin. I know you know me, He reminded the officer they had met before. I said to him, five days ago, I told you the other day, go home to your family safe, and let the next person go make family safe. But the dad guy look at you as a maggot. You can also hear Chauvin on the body cam. We got to kind of control this guy because he's a sizable guy. Yeah, and I tried to, I tried to like get, get in the car. It looks like he's probably on something. Jurors also seeing video of George Floyd in the minutes before the tragedy unfolded, looking relaxed in the convenience store. Chris Martin, who worked there, describing his demeanor. He seemed very friendly, um, approachable, but he did seem high. But the store worker said Floyd paid for a pack of cigarettes with a phony $20 bill. After he left the store, the store manager called the police. The store worker, with his hand on his head, then watched the tragedy unfold, saying he felt guilty. All of this over a $20 bill. What was going through your mind during that time period? Uh, disbelief. Thank you. Okay. Why guilt? Um, if I would have just not taken the bill. This could have been avoided. Our thanks to Alex. And for more analysis of the trial, we bring in criminal defense attorney and former Chicago police officer Dan Herbert. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Herbert. I want to start with that video of Floyd's arrest shown in court today. Floyd doesn't want to get into that police car saying that he's claustrophobic. This all happening before he's pulled out of the car and later pinned down by the neck under Chauvin's knee, of course. From what we see in these images, does this look like at least the beginning of a standard arrest? It, it looks like the beginning of a standard arrest for sure, and and it looks like somebody that is uh, that is clearly uh, does not want to go to jail and is and is resisting. But you say at some point Chauvin's actions seem to become unreasonable. When was that point in your mind, and perhaps under the law? Well, it, it, in my mind, it's uh, the moment that the knee was placed on the neck. Uh, an important thing to remember here is he's in handcuffs. So, you know, he cannot move his arms. Um, just watching that video, like putting on my police hat, I was thinking the only thing that's movable here is essentially his legs. So uh, to kneel on the legs, to me, would have been just a much more appropriate thing. But for the law, they are allowed to use um, that type of a uh, restraining method. Um, you know, I, at I, I think- At that time, at that time, no longer now. Yeah, right, and most states don't have that anymore either. And the prosecution also showed video today of George Floyd in Cup Foods before his arrest, looking like he may be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Walk us through why prosecutors would present video that arguably supports Chauvin's defense that Floyd was on drugs that day. You know, it's a really good question, Lindsay, and, and I thought the same thing. And as I watched it, um, I, I think uh, what the prosecutors were trying to do was to show that, um, you know, that Mr. Floyd's uh, aggression uh, kind of ticked off these police officers. And because they were acting out of emotion, that's what caused them to do this. It wasn't necessarily for the restraining, it was because they wanted to essentially show him a message. And that was my thought on why they would play that. And we heard more emotional testimony today from bystanders, some of them crying on the stand. How much did the prosecution help their case today with those witnesses, do you think? 
They really did. Um, you know, the, the more eyewitnesses that are there on the scene, that gives the state, uh, the prosecutors, the ability to call those witnesses um, and, re most importantly, replay the video. And they're allowed to do that because the defense has made the actions of the eyewitnesses um, central to this case. And also, they have those panoram panoramic views of the uh, outside of the store. And to me, I think they were trying to show that this was like a Norman Rockwell setting. It was not a, uh, a violent situation at all. Defense Attorney Dan Herbert, thank you so much. Appreciate your time and analysis. Thank you. And now to our nation's ongoing humanitarian crisis at the border. Today, new video released by U.S. Customs and Border Protection giving us a chilling picture of the dangers children face at the hands of human smugglers. Chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega brings us the latest on the children behind these images and the reaction from our government. The video is difficult to watch in the dark of night on a remote stretch of the southern border caught on surveillance camera. An apparent smuggler on the Mexican side straddles the fence, hoisting a small child over, dropping her 14 feet below to the U.S. side. Moments later, the same thing, a second child dropped to the ground. Then the two suspects flee up the trail back into Mexico. Authorities say those children, two young sisters from Ecuador, just three and five years old. A Border Patrol agent spotted the activity on camera and jumped into action. The Biden administration grappling with the surge of migrants at the southern border. More than 18,000 children now in U.S. custody. We saw that surge ourselves on a recent trip. Authorities overwhelmed. How organized are these smugglers? Oh, they know. I think they, I think they got better intel than we have. They got spotters. They, they know where we're at. I'm sure they know where we're at right now. And I just got off the phone with the Border Patrol chief in that area where the little girls were found. They were taken to a hospital. They are okay. The chief tells me that they're seeing 100 unaccompanied minors in that El Paso area alone every single day. Most, if not all of them, are coming here with the help of smugglers. The chief is also telling me that authorities have made contact with a little girl's mom who is here in the U.S. to let her know that they are okay. Lindsay. Good to know that, Cecilia. Thanks so much. And now we turn to an update on pop icon Britney Spears, who is speaking out for the first time about that recent Hulu documentary, Framing Britney Spears. The singer took to Instagram yesterday, revealing that she cried for two weeks over the film and that she did not approve of the way it depicted her life. Kaylee Hartung has more. Britney Spears breaking her silence, saying she cried for two weeks because of the wildly popular Hulu documentary about her life and career. Hi, Britney. Spears posting on Instagram, I didn't watch the documentary, but from what I did see of it, I was embarrassed by the light they put me in. The thing that people became fascinated with was her sort of unraveling. Adding, I still cry sometimes. Would you hold it against me? This is the first reaction from Britney following the film's February release. Framing Britney Spears takes a closer look at her rise to superstardom and years of tabloid headlines. The singer writing about the toll that's taken. My life has always been very speculated, watched, and judged really my whole life. I've always been so judged, insulted, and embarrassed by the media, and I still am till this day. Hey, she's trying to get out. Front and center in framing Britney, the court-mandated conservatorship that has been making medical and financial decisions for her since 2008. Put in place after a bitter divorce, custody battle, and two hospitalizations. And a viral movement to free Britney. Fans of the pop star who claim the conservatorship is being used to control her against her will. The conservatorship has got to go. Now, a judge deciding whether to grant her request to permanently appoint Jody Montgomery, who's been overseeing Britney's personal decisions for years. If the judge approves, Montgomery would also be granted control over Britney's visitors, hire caretakers, and oversee medical and psychiatric health care. Her father, who stepped down as her conservator of person amid health issues in 2019, would remain part of the group controlling her finances, along with an outside trust. Now Britney says it's time for kindness. I do what I can in my own spirituality with myself to try and keep my own joy, love, and happiness. I'm not here to be perfect. Perfect is boring. Our thanks to Kaylee for that. And still to come, the fighting continues for a town in Mozambique with ISIS allegedly making gains. And our conversation with Matthew Russian, his story galvanized so many online, what he and his mother have to say about the outpouring of support they received. Stay with us. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Do you reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour. The fierce fighting in and around that town in Mozambique continues with militants tied to ISIS terrorizing the population. We are told many people are still missing and the brutality is said to be horrifying. According to the UN, thousands have fled the area. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has declared a hunger strike in protest over what he says is authorities' refusal to provide him with proper medical care. He apparently has a back in in injury that is spread to his legs. You may recall the outspoken Putin critic was poisoned with a deadly nerve agent, many pointing the finger at the Kremlin. Navalny survived to tell the tale after receiving medical care in Germany, only to return to his native Russia to be arrested on what many consider to be trumped up charges. French schools will close for at least three weeks as that country where many are wary of vaccine struggles to contain variant fueled infections. The lockdown in France will mean all non-essential shops will close starting Saturday. All right, imagine parking your car to go shopping only to return to find a swarm of bees have taken over upon your return. That's exactly what happened to a man in New Mexico, and luckily just the right person showed up to take care of the problem. ABC's Marcus Moore has this story. A buzzy situation in New Mexico. Do you have anybody on call? 15,000 bees swarming one man's car in a supermarket parking lot while he was shopping. The man driving away before even noticing they were inside. Firefighters responding to the scene but didn't know what to do. Working the scene for two hours, calling in an expert to help. Jesse Johnson, a firefighter who was off duty, who, as luck would have it, happens to be an avid beekeeper. So uh, I said, okay. I'll come get it for you guys. That way we can free up the crew and, and get this guy home. Johnson dressed in protective gear, taking a portable bee yard out of his vehicle and using lemongrass oil to remove the wayward pollinators. The spring is the most common time for bees to swarm. Bees are very docile when they're swarming. What they're doing is they're splitting the colony. Johnson removing the bees in just five minutes, taking them to his backyard bee farm where he plans to take care of them. It is important because all types of pollinators are having issues. It's vital that we have these insects to just continue pollination. 
Our thanks to Marcus. And now to the latest on a story that we first brought you at the end of last year regarding the arrest and imprisonment of Matthew Russian. Russian, who has autism, received a conditional pardon after his involvement in two car crashes, one of which left a man disabled. His family claims that he was having an emotional episode at the time of the accidents, and his mother pleaded that her son's condition be considered as part of his case. As of this week, Matthew is officially a free man, and he and his mother, Laverne, join us now. Thank you so much for being here and talking with us tonight. Matthew, the obvious question, how does it feel to be back home again? It feels amazing. I'm, I'm glad that all that is now behind me, and we can focus on the more important things at hand. And Laverne, how do you feel to, to have your son back home? And have you noticed any change in, in your son since his return? Um, I'm actually, you know, overjoyed that he's home. Um, changes, he eats more vegetables now, um, and he's eating a lot more. Um, I, I made macaroni and cheese and, and uh, salmon for him um, as a first home cooked meal. So yeah, that was, that was a change that I saw, more vegetables. But healthy? Healthy, um, yes. Uh, you know, obviously he still has a cyst on his pituitary gland that we have to um, take care of. But health-wise, he, he's good. Um, you know, obviously with the mental health care, um, he is going to need a lot of that and um, in, in the future. And, and Matthew, of course, you're back home with mom and sister. Tell us about some of the first things that you did. Of course, the first meal you ate, mom just said, was that salmon and mac and cheese. What were you looking most forward to about being back at home taking a shower without my shoes on mm. uh, that that was that that's what I've been telling everybody and it's true it's just being able to be comfortable and, and you said you were looking forward to focusing now on the important things what's next what are you what are you planning on focusing on now well of course I'm going back to school and um, I decided to take up speech therapy for special education. Growing up, I had a really bad stutter. I stutter every now and again now, but um, I've also started to realize, well, I realized while being locked up that there were guys in there who had autism, didn't know that they were autistic and didn't know how to interact with people. And so I want to work with kids who are autistic or have Down syndrome or have or are deaf, mute, have any sort of speech disorder or anything of that manner and help them to become more sociable amongst their peers. And Laverne, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew's pardon is conditional and his release comes with very specific guidelines. What are some of those guidelines? So um, obviously he cannot contact the families anymore. Um, he cannot drive um, for the rest of his life unless um, 10 years from now he, um, you know, goes back to court, goes back in front of a judge to have that reinstated. Um, no firearms, um, and actually, the, the other part of that is um, he has to have the mental health treatment, um, which he was already having. But I think that more focuses on, um, you know, his ability to to move forward in life. And and Laverne, you also really led a social media charge uh, to get your son released. Uh, what would you like to say to, to some of your advocates, including uh, Culture City? I would like to say thank you so much. Um, in the Innocence Project, uh, Jason Fahm, um, Beyonce's mom, uh, Tina Knowles, Jamie Lee Curtis, and everyone who has stepped up, I would, I mean, I'm beyond words of gratitude. I I can't even begin to tell you how I appreciate um, you know them supporting us from the very beginning. I was not going to let Matthew become a statistic, and I voiced that from the very beginning. And they allowed me to take my fight to social media. And lastly, Matthew, were you aware of all of Mom's efforts in order to make sure that you were able to get back home? Um.
Well, for the most part, there of course, there were certain things that due to the recorded phone calls, uh, she couldn't tell me, but um, since I've been home, I've been reading up on all the stories and all her posts and everyone else's posts, and now I'm starting to understand the um, the entire magnitude of, of what she was doing while I was locked up. And it all worked out in the end. Matthew and Laverne Russian, we thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you talking with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great night. I know what happened and I'm not guilty.